Okay. By the time we get to this portion, I probably use it. This last class it goes by quick. It's not even. It doesn't even have to be 30 minutes long. But there's a ton of information on how to get right. One of the things most Christians do, they continue to walk around with these masks. And who in here is fake? Who in here is fake and you know you're fake? What do I mean? Are you fake? What am I talking about? What am I talking about? Two-faced. How? How? <laughs> yeah, go ahead. Ah, so true. Sometimes people ask you, how you doing? And you're like, blessed and highly favored. And, 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 and no, you feel like crap inside. You're dying inside. What's the difference between this and this? This is fake. What's this? We, that's right. What's the purpose of the mask? Explain that. Dude, if you can find that, send it. Not, 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 not sometime now. soon. Here's the thing. I, I don't care who you are. Everyone, to some degree, I don't care who you are. Everybody, to some degree, is fake. We're all fake to some degree. The, what the problem with being fake is that, I can put it right here. <coughs> this guy is 10% real. He's 90% fake. This is a problem. And most Christians that walk around, we have this mask on. Like we're okay and we're not we have secret sins and shame and guilt Here, here's a question for you between shame and guilt which one's worse between shame and guilt which one's worse shame guilt shame shame See, there's a big difference between shame and guilt. Some people say, well, it's the same thing. It's not the same thing. If you, if you ever read suicide notes, these people, they're ashamed. Shame is worse. The reason why shame is worth, worse is because guilt speaks to an act. Shame speaks to an identity. Guilt says, I did wrong. Shame says, I am wrong. And this is most Christians today walk around with guilt and shame and regret. They have secrets. There's one of the things God showed me a long time ago. He said, Nick, there are no secrets in heaven. And I remember saying, okay, yeah, well, that makes sense. That tracks. And I, <laughs> if there are no secrets in heaven, why do you have them on the earth, Nick? And I, I knew because of shame and guilt. And so if you're carrying shame and guilt and regret, I promise you, that's, that's a place that, that you're supposed to deal with and get forgiveness for it, right? I'm going to share some things with you here in a minute about some of my past. And you're gonna, some of you will be shocked, like, I can't believe. You know, when I was getting ordained, <laughs> um, me and this, it was a master sergeant. I was a gunny. We were both retiring at the same time, getting ordained at the same organization in California. And um, my pastor... My friend Todd and me were driving up and down the highway going to Fresno and whatnot. And uh, we started talking about our past and who we were and things that we'd done. And I, I got on a ramble about who I did and what I'd done coming up. And they were just, it got silent for like an hour. And they were just quiet, listening like, oh, I thought I was bad, but damn, Nick. And when they got done, when I got done, I'm looking at them like, I don't understand, what? And they said, well, <laughs> well, uh, some of that stuff you, you might have wanted to share after you got ordained because now we're wondering, should we even ordain you now? And they were joking, but they were saying, uh, wow, well, you're going to hear some of this stuff. You're going to say, how can, God, how can God use you after you've done all that mess? Take it up with him. I'm forgiven. Are you? Because when I share some of my stuff, it frees you up and shows you. You're going to hear some things about why I can share. You know, being molested as a kid. Fondling my sister as a kid. 
And he's like, what? I can't believe you said that. Why can't I say it? I'm, I'm free. I'm not bound by that, that, that lie and that sin anymore. I'm not bound by that. I've been forgiven. That's old Nick. I had my family throw some of my stuff up in my face. And I'm like, yeah, 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 you can't. Not going to work here, player. Because uh, that, that's old Nick. And old Nick has been crucified with Christ. And new Nick is standing before you. New Nick is in the work in progress. And new Nick has been forgiven. And new Nick is free to tell you more. I'll tell you more. What else do you need to know? This is why I'm pretty bold about stuff that I've done. Because I'm forgiven for it. Yeah, if they're fortunate enough to, if they're fortunate enough, because we go off on our own, and if we're fortunate enough that God has mercy on our lives and draws us back into His redemption and forgiveness, then that's a good thing because God, God can work with that. But a lot of people don't; they just go off the deep end. So now. What's the, everyone has a fake self. What's the goal of the fake, fake self? We create a fake mask. What's the goal? It's to, to hide and protect the real hurting self. God can never be a part of this. This is an idol. This is a mask. This is fake. God can never be with a fake image of myself. God will always be with the real hurting self. This is why you've got to be honest. When we talk about exposure and confession, you have to be honest with God. And when you confess, this ain't this, and hear me closely on this, this ain't this, oh God, oh Father God, oh merciful Lord, great art thou in the heavenlies. I'm a sinner, I'm backslidden. Thank you for forgiving me. Oh, I feel good. That's crap. That is not a prayer. A real prayer is one that you feel your sins. And when you feel your sins, you're desperate for forgiveness. You're desperate for redemption. You have to feel your sins. And so a repentant prayer sounds like, God, oh God, God, I'm a whore. God, the things I've done, I can't be trusted, God. God, I'm a mess. I'm a fake. God, I don't even understand how, how you can use me for some of the crap that I've done. It nevertheless, is by your mercy, Lord. You have to get real with God. Watch, I'll explain. This is, when we're talking about restoration and getting right just with our sexual sins, it takes all of this right here. It takes forgiveness. It takes healing. It takes deliverance, exposure, immersion. It takes prayer. It takes fasting. And it takes you getting into works. All of this stuff will heal you. I've, I've learned from personal experience that the degree to which you immerse yourself in the things of God is the degree to which you get saved. I'll, I'll prove that in just a second. I'll prove it in a second. You'll see it very, very plainly. <sighs> so, I love this. He makes all things new. Years ago, <laughs> years ago, <clears throat> I, um, I joined the Marine Corps in 1980. Before my first year was up, I was at Camp Lejeune, and the unit had gone to like Fort Pickett or something like that, and they were training. And so I was left in the rear with the gear, so I had a lot of free time on my hands. And uh, <coughs> one of the things I did, I went with a friend of mine to a camera shop on Western Boulevard. You guys familiar with Western Boulevard? Dude, uh, let me be honest with you. I think two years ago, we went back to Lejeune. I hadn't been in Lejeune in years. And I, I, I cried as I was showing my daughters and my wife. We were driving down 24. We were driving up and down Western Boulevard. And I was, it was bittersweet because on the one hand, I was telling my family, I was ashamed to tell them. I said, right there, I got arrested for doing something. Right here, I got caught doing this over here I sold drugs right there to this guy over here and over here I bought my first Bible and then uh, over here I got in a fight with this black kid over there and so and just about every I got my first DUI there I got my second one right there and uh, I got arrested on the base one time doing this and everywhere I was going it was 
It was so bad. Matter of fact, there was a Hardee's right there on Western Boulevard. It's not there anymore. The building is still there. And uh, I said, I got arrested right there. And right down the street right there is where I got my, my a felony for stealing a sweatsuit. And I went running down here to this Western Boulevard, uh, Hardee's, and my girlfriend had me working there at the time. And I went inside the bathroom and I took off the sweatsuit and I stuffed it in the in the ceiling and as soon as I come out of the bathroom Onslow County Sheriff's Department was there they arrested me in front of my girlfriend threw me up against the car and I'm against the car and they, they got the sweatsuit and everything embarrassing and because it was over $75 it's a felony some felon D block hardcore nuka <laughs> it's a simple felony it's a felony anyway man pisses me off and so um embarrassing and uh, doing community, I did community service there and so on. One of the things that happened when my unit was at Pickett, my, my buddy said, come with me, I want to go buy a camera. And so we went in on Western Boulevard, and I found the place where the camera store was at. There was, I pulled up into the parking space. It's kind of like the store was like this. I pulled up into the parking space, <coughs> and the guy who was a fat white guy, he looked like Santa Claus. And that's how I remembered him, because he was just a fat white guy with big beard. He looked like Santa Claus. And we went inside, and we're standing at the counter, and my friend is saying, I want to see that camera right there. And the dude turned around and reached up for the camera. I reached over the counter, and I, in, in the glass counter, I stole a zoom lens. Brand new zoom lens, still in the box. I took a zoom lens. And the zoom lens, um, I didn't even have a camera. I didn't know anything about camera. I just stole a zoom lens because it was funny. I was like, oh, yeah, yeah, I stole a zoom lens. Stupid as all get out. Just dumb. Absolutely dumb. And so I'm, I'm carrying the zoom lens around. And uh, probably my friend was probably embarrassed. No, I, I didn't think about that, though. And so that was in 81. In 92, after the Gulf War, I got back from the Gulf. And God, basically, I'm a Christian now. Been around the world and all kind of other stuff is going on. I'm a sergeant. And God says, I'm going through my... Foot Locker, and I'm cleaning out all my porn magazines, uh, stolen stuff and borrowed stuff. I'm just getting rid of all this crap in my house because it's a cleansing. And I'm going through my Foot Locker, and there's a zoom lens still in the original box. I may have opened it one time. And I'm about to toss away, but the Spirit of God says, take it back. Like, what? What? Get thee behind me, Satan. And I'm like, no, that's, that is not of God. Take it back. And I knew it was God. He said, take it back. And I'm wrestling with this thing like, what, what will I tell the guy if I take it back? What's going to happen if I take it back? And I didn't tell Sandy about this. And so I'm wrestling all day. And I, said, I know I'm going to take it back, but man, I'm, I'm, I'm afraid. I'm like, I'm going to the brig tonight. As soon as I take it back, he's going to call the MPs. My career is over. I'm done. And I'm, I'm shaking in my boots, man. I'm like, yeah, jeez. And I look in the yellow pages, and the place is still there. I'm like, man, oh, man. So sure enough, later on that evening, I um, get in my car. I go out there, and I pull up to the parking space. Santa Claus is still in there. And I'm like, oh, God. I said, God, are you sure? I don't know. What am I going to say? I don't know what I'm going to say. And I'm wrestling. I'm afraid. And I'm, I'm, but I, I felt like when I first got saved, I said, God, I never want you to have to tell me to do something twice. So I'm going to do it, but God, I hope you're with me because I'm going to the brig tonight. And so I walk in there, and as I promise you, I don't know what I'm going to say. And I'm walking in there, and the guy, Santa Claus, stops, and he's looking at me, and I'm like, you know, when I put it on the counter, I went like this. These words came out of my mouth. This belongs to you. It was stolen from you about 10 years ago. The man who stole it is dead. <laughs> that was it. And I walked out. And I promise you, he didn't say anything. He just looked at it. And he didn't say anything. And I waited for him to say something. And I just turned and walked out. And I, I can still remember this. When I sat in my car, it's like this, this Shekinah glory was fall, dissipating, coming off of me. And I realized, uh, this is what happened. I think God took over my stupidity and my fear and basically was guiding me under his spirit. Because that those were not my words that came out of my mouth. 
I didn't even know about 2 Corinthians 5, 17. If any man be in Christ, he's a new creature. Behold, all old things have passed, all things have become new. And so I'm sitting there just trying to go over what just happened, and I'm like, I was under a spell, and God, what, what just happened? And God began to show me. He said, he said I, Nick, I will always meet you at the point of obedience. When you obey me, I will meet you there. If I tell you to be there, get there, I'll show up. I'll put words in your mouth. Just trust me. Man, I was blown away. And then months later, I saw this scripture, and I was going nuts. Like, that's it. That's what happened. I'm a new creature. Nick, did I lie? And I've had Christians say, oh, you just lied. No, I didn't. God, God gave me those words. You, you Pharisee. Yeah, no, I didn't lie. God gave me this, th those words. And so the reason why I'm telling you all this, why am I, tell why am I telling you this? Because I'm free to tell you this. I'm free to tell you. You ain't heard nothing yet. Sinners. Check this out. I told you there are no secrets in heaven. Secrets, guilt, shame, regret creates the fake self. Oof, I went over that. There's exposure right here when uh, uh, Jesus told the lepers, go show, go show yourself to the priests. And I think there was 10 of them. And one of them came back because he was healed on the way. There was, there was something to be, he said, expose yourself to the priest. Expose yourself. Go, go show the priest that you've been healed. And a lot of times you're called to expose yourself. You're called to expose your sins. The Bible's very clear about confess your faults one to another. It, yeah, you're supposed to confess. It, that's not asking you. Confess your faults, please. It's not. It's telling you. Confess to someone. So, uh, huh? Confess to someone? Yeah. Listen, when I say that, well, I'm, since you asked, when I tell you to confess to someone, everybody listen to me very closely, you never confess down. You never confess down. It's like going to your five-year-old child. Oh, I committed adultery and da, 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 da. I watch porn and all this other stuff. You can't do that to that five-year-old for the same reason why I don't confess to you guys about a lot of my struggles. Because it's, 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 it's too much for you. You couldn't, understand. you couldn't understand. You always confess up. You always confess up to someone that's been where you're going. Someone, a pastor, a chaplain, someone who's greater than you and you know he can handle it. possible it's possible but do you can everyone handle your mess that's what I'm talking about you be that's different that's different there, there are times when God's going to tell you to share with people because they need to hear it like me being molested by my uncle I was molested by my uncle when I was like four or five years old and I didn't remember this this had to be like 66 1966 and <laughs> Was that you? <laughs> and so, whatever. Whatever. You know what? When, when you become 62, send me pictures of you. Because I promise you're going to be fat and nasty. All of you, you're going to be ugly. You're gonna be you, you, I'm going to still be around. I'm going to still be around. And so I'm still somewhat bulletproof. Not completely. I'm, I'm good for five minutes. After five minutes, I need oxygen. Anyway, what ended up happening when I was four or five years old, I was molested by my uncle. Completely forgot about it. Completely forgot about it. Until my wife and I. What year did uh, your dad pass away, Sandy? 95. In 95. In 95, I went TAD to New Orleans. <coughs> we were going there for, for a conference. And what happened, we stopped at, in Atlanta. To, for, for, we had some pastor friends there, mega church down there, man. We had a blast. We got, went to the church service. And there's probably a thousand people there, and the pastor, the bishop, was talking about sexual sins and being molested as children. And at the end, he had an altar call. I said, raise your hand if you've been hurt and you've you got secrets, sexual secrets and stuff like that. I promise you, 70% of the church raised their hands. Giant flooded altar call. And I was just so happy for them. I was like, ah, glory, ah, glory to God, these people are getting sexually healed. And so the service was over. Said goodbye to the bishop and his wife and a bunch of the people there. Got in our rental, and we started heading I-75 South, and about an hour out of Atlanta, um, <whistles> boom, 
boom, it hit me. And I remembered everything like it happened five minutes ago. I hadn't thought about this thing. And this is how many years? 30 years later. It's about 30 years later. And this thing hit me. And I remembered the taste, the smell. I remembered the manipulation. I remembered the sounds. I remembered everything. And I began to cry. And Sandy's like sitting next to me like, what, you okay? What's wrong? What's wrong? And I'm whispering under my breath. Oh, God, this is going to the grave with me. What just happened in that moment? Shame. This flooded with shame. I was like, ah, what? My uncle. And he's a Marine, too. He was active duty Marine. Big dude. He's about your size. And he's my uncle. He's my uncle. And um, I remembered everything. And I'm just shocked. And I'm stuck. And I'm like, what just happened? And, uh, and I swore under my breath. I said, God, this is going to the grave with me. No one will ever find out about this. And so from 95 to what year did Mona pass away? Four years. Four years went by and I struggled with this secret, this shame. I carried it and I'm struggling with it. And then here we are overseas now and I, my sister gets killed in a car accident. She's the only saved person in my family at the time. Sandy and I, we go home and there's, we get to the airport. So it's me, Sandy and the three girls and they're small, they're babies. And I rented, we're at the airport. We went to the rental car company and we got a small sub compact car, Marine budget. And so I'm packing everything in there, two seats and everything, all the luggage and car seats, all kind of stuff. I'm getting it on there. It's going to fit because I'm a freaking Marine. I know how to pack this thing up. And as I'm just about there. And this black couple comes walking up to us and they're mugging us. They're checking us out. I was suspicious. I told Sandy, watch the luggage. I'm going to keep an eye on these guys. And the dude walked up to me. He said, hey, I noticed um, you have a large family. You have a lot of luggage and you only have a small car. And we have a van. And um, what we would like to do is switch vehicles with you and we want to pay for everything complete random strangers and i and i knew they were christians i said you guys are christians aren't you they said yeah we are i said why don't you christians mind your own business why don't you, you mind your own business i'm over here doing my business you're always so nosy leave me alone and they were like what i said it's a joke i receive it yeah yeah and so they they, they took us they took us inside to the red the, the counter we redid all the contracts and the guy said i'm renting both of these cars he's authorized for the van and when he drops that van off if there's any additional charges charges to me you talk about a good samaritan well now watch this is god moving right because i was molested by my uncle my sister's dead and uh so this van was instrumental because the the house is crowded because people come visiting bring food and all this other stuff house there's no privacy I would go into the back of this van because I had to preach at my sister's funeral and I would <coughs> close all the doors, get in the back of the van, lay the bench down. There was a table. AC was on. Quiet. Dude, I had the best time back there just praying and just God was ministering to me. And then I'm back and I'm out there and I hear this. And I look out the window. It's another one of my sisters. And she says, hey, we thought you went for a walk. I said, no, I'm just out here getting ready for the funeral and blah, blah, blah. She says, Uncle Raymond's here. Man, I freaked out. And God showed me. God said, Nick, it's time. And then God showed me exactly what's going to happen. He says, you're going to go in. I saw this. You're going to go inside. You're going to say hi to everybody. And then you're going to say, I'm going to go for a walk. And Uncle Raymond's going to say, he's going to call you by your first name. Hey, Dominic, I'm going to go with you. And sure enough, I said, okay, Lord, here goes. Went inside, said hi to everybody, and said, you know what? I'm going to go for a walk. And Uncle Raymond said, hey, Dominic, I'll go with you. Dude, we got to walking down the road. We must have walked for 15, 20 minutes, and I'm scared. I'm hemming and hawing. How do you bring this up? And I'm just beating around the bush, and I just finally stopped. I said, okay, Uncle Raymond, I remember what you did to me when I was four or five years old. And he just stopped, and his face was just shocked. And I said, I'm not here to start any drama. I'm not here to put your, your business, tell everybody. I'm here to let you know I forgive you. And, man, he, big dude, Jesus was like in the middle of the street, the highway, just crying like, oh. He was wailing. And he just kept on crying. I was just waiting like, what just? 
And he was crying. And he said, Dominic, you don't understand. I said, you okay? What's going on? He said, you don't understand. He said, for the last four years, I've been stuck. I said, what do you mean? He said, about four years ago, about the same time you said that you remembered what I did to you, about four years ago, I found out that my oldest son, who was 15 at the time, was, had been molested by my neighbor. And he said, I knew where the neighbor lived at to that day. He said, I was so mad. I went and I grabbed the car keys and I'm going out the door and I got to the door and the Holy Spirit spoke to me and said, you hypocrite. You did the same thing to your nephew. And he said, I have been stuck for four years, not knowing whether to call you. I, I was been afraid. I didn't know what to do. And then he just cried and we prayed. He said, I know what to do to bring healing in my family. We have to forgive. We're going to report him, but we have to forgive him. Maybe God will get him too and save that guy. Why can I say this? Why can I, why can I tell you this? Being molested by my uncle. Because when I had said, this is going to the grave with me. <laughs> because God took the shame and the guilt off of me. That's bondage. I'm free to tell you a bunch of stuff about my past. Because I don't care what you think. I don't. The shame and guilt's gone. See, chapter one, Nick, crap, mess, fool. Chapter two, Nick got saved. Chapter three, God took God, Nick's mess and turned it into Nick's message now for the Lord. God took my mess and turned it into my message. Make sense? <coughs> Boy, y'all ain't heard nothing yet. I'll t wait, you just wait. One more. One time I went home because my grandmother had passed away. And the funeral's over, and we're over with my mom and her sisters, and they're all talking about molestation that is rampant in the family. Hispanic families, molestation is rampant in Hispanic families. Incest. Hispanic families, they've been targeted with incest. It's huge. And if you don't think in, uh, um, incest and stuff like that is in your family, grow up. <laughs> it's, it's there. But Hispanic families, it's a whole nother level. And so I'm sitting there listening to my funeral, all the uncles and aunts and everybody shows up and uh, they're at the table and they're talking about what their, all of my mom and her sisters were all molested by all her brothers and even the grandpa, their dad. And I'm pissed because I'm a young minister. And I'm like, you know what? I know what the hotels the uncles are at. And so this is me flapping at the gums, so stupid. I said, I know where the uncles are at. I'm going to call the hotel. And in front of all my aunts and my sisters, I said, I'm going to call the hotel and tell them, I know what you did. Get over here and apologize. And then about that time, my baby sister, the one who got killed in a car accident, the one that I went to the funeral, she went running out of the room. And I was like, what, what was that about? Yeah. And so anyway, I didn't call my uncles or anything. I just hugged because I had to go back to the airport, turn the car in and get out of here. So I hugged everybody by. I got in the car and I'm heading to the airport. And then God showed me. He said, you did the same thing to your sister. I said, oh, oh, oh. And so I, man, I was panicking. I went zoom into the car rental place, turned the car in. I'm almost late for my flight. I had to get to the check-in counter, got my ticket. I couldn't stop to make a phone call because we didn't have cell phones back then. Um, but we had... I got on my seat and we had these phones on the back of the plane. You ever seen them phones with the credit card slide? You could slide your card through it. Very expensive phone calls, but I didn't care. I slid that thing through there, called Mona up. I said, Mona, 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 I'm so sorry. I know why you left the room. I remember what I did to you. I fondled you. I molested you. I'm so sorry. Please forgive me. And she was crying. I was crying. She says, Nick, thank you for calling me. I forgive you. Dude, do you know not long after that, maybe a month later, she died. I went home like in August for a funeral, and then I went home again in October for a funeral, my sister's funeral. And I feel like God gave me a window to make it right with my sister before she passed away. Does that make sense? You understand that, that I'm, I'm free to tell you this because I'm a, pretty, I'm a mess, but God took my mess, and he's, he's healed me. He's forgiven me all that stuff that was up there. He's, yeah. Okay, here we go. 
Risk versus reward. Here you go. When you expose stuff, it's risky. I promise you it's risky. And you're going to make mistakes. And it's like, why should I tell people my mess? Well, number one, God told you to confess. First of all, confess up. All right? Call me. We'll work it out. And we'll, we'll, we'll hear you out. We'll listen to you. And we'll pray with you. All right? Um, I think I have to tell you this. Whatever sexual sins that you have, I am not releasing you to call home and tell your people, your wife, your wife's people about any sins that you've committed. I'm not telling you to do that. Uh, you don't have my permission to do that. So if you do it, you're on your own. Because I've had more Marines in here <laughs> over the years call me up on Monday after the Saturday class or something, call me up and say, Pastor Nick, my, my father-in-law's mad at me. My wife's mad at me. Well, why? Because I confessed. I called the dad up and confessed. You told me to. I didn't tell you to do that. He said, well, I'm supposed to tell everybody, ain't I? Nope. And I, I, my wife's mad at me because I confessed to her about some things that I did. I didn't tell you to do that. So I'm telling you. I'm not telling you to do that. Take it a step at a time. All right? Let it marinate. Let Be led by the Spirit of God. You're probably going to make some mistakes. But just know God will open that door when it's time. It's risky to share your mess. But the reward is great. We, I told you about the homosexual couple, well, these three guys that were wrestling with homosexuality in a church, and they wrote this in uh, Charisma magazine or something. And these three homosexuals, they were tired with dealing with homosexuality. They went to the pastor in the middle of the week, said, the three of us are dealing with homosexuality. And the pastor ministered to them, talked to them and whatnot, and said, well, okay, we'll take another step after, after the weekend. On Sunday, unbeknownst to these three guys, he had the three of them come up and stand up on the stage. And then he said, these three men are struggling with homosexuality. What are you going to do about it? Dude. When the pastor paused and said, these three men are struggling with homosexuality, what do you think these men felt? Embarrassment, shame, fear, like, oh. And they wrote about this. They said, we did not know he was going to do this. And so they felt exposed. But when the pastor said, what are you going to do about it? The church got up in mass and came and hugged on them and prayed with them and helped them walk out of that mess. And they said in the next instant, we, we felt so exposed, but in the next instant, we've never felt so loved. Oh, it's risky. I promise you, it's risky. Sin is shameful. It is, but you've got to get it off you. You've got to expose it. There's no getting around it. You have to expose your sins. Yes? Hi. Okay. And then, so the thing is, let's say these people expose all their sins. This guy, because I met people like this. I don't have to, God's forgive me. I don't have to expose my sins. God's forgiven me. I don't have to tell nobody about it. And they, I've had deacons and ministers say, I press on toward the goal. Prize of high calling because forgetting what's behind me, I press on. Are they right? <coughs> to some degree, they're right. But which one can God use more? The ones that are willing to put their pride aside and give God glory for forgiving them. So the ones that exposed all their mess, they're strong now. All these, these weak bricks are gone. And then they can stand up and say, let me, let me show you the path out. It has to do with exposure. Watch. There's this cleansing. I told you about this cleansing. I want to show you something. This is a three-part being. Can you guys see that? What, is, what are the three parts? Mm-hmm. What's the cup? What's the glass? Body. The body. What's the water? The soul. And what's that? That's your spirit man. Your spirit man is not, is not going to be affected because that's where God is, right? Okay, so this one is pure. He hasn't sinned yet. Now watch. How much sin should we drop in there? Let's just try try two two drops. One, one more, because I only sinned twice sexually. Two sins. Okay, so what just happened?
What just happened? Sandy, you have a pitcher of water? Yes. Fill that up, please. That's what I, that's what I forgot. Thanks, Whitney. Okay, so let me ask you something. This is most people today. Let's put some more in there, a couple more. I mean, how many do I have to put in there for us? <laughs> okay, did that affect that? Did, is it polluted? Okay. How are we going to fix that? Because now your soul is tainted. Your soul is polluted. Yeah? Just put it right there. Your soul is polluted. How are we going to fix this? Because we're talking about healing. Yeah, definitely Christ. But here, here's what it looks like. This is what Christians do. I'm going to church on Christmas. <sighs> woo -hoo -hoo! Did you see the drop? Okay, wait, wait, wait. Easter, baby. <laughs> oh, 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 revival. <laughs> is, it, is it working? Did that, did that dilute and do anything to that water? It did. It's minuscule, though. It's microscopic. Wait a minute. I forgot Mother's Day. Oh, let's mix that up, baby. Dilution. Did it do anything? So how long will this take, this, this approach to cleansing and restoration? How long will this take? A long time. What I'm telling you, what I did... <laughs> what I did, I repented to the Lord and I just came and I said, God, I'm a mess. God. And I, just, I was broken before God. I said, God, what can you do for me? What's happening? What's happening there? Look at that. What's the difference with, with that eyedropper in this picture? What just happened? Look at that. What just happened? What's the, what's the principle here? Stay hydrated. <laughs> Who said stay hydrated? What's the, what's, the, what's the lesson here? The degree to which you get healed and cleansed is up to you. If you just want to flirt with forgiveness and restoration... Just show up every now and then and read your Bible every now and then. Good luck with that. That's going to take a while. But when you just say, God, I'm done. I'm done. I'm, I can't. I, I got to have you. I need you. Without you, I'm nothing. I'm dying here. And then this happens. I've learned this from personal experience. I'm, I'm a restored soul. I'm also still a work in progress. But man, God has brought me through a lot of things. Does that make sense, guys? We're almost done. So led by the Holy Spirit, here's the bottom line. <sighs> this is all pollution. I showed you the pollution, yeah? The solution is Christ. You get a lot of Christ in you. There's a dilution that happens. And after that dilution happens, there's a revolution. Got it? So pollution, solution, dilution, revolution. That's what happens. And here's a lot of scriptures right here. The degree to which you seek Christ. All of these scriptures. Just look at all that. The other thing is you, you just need to assume that you're being attacked and the enemy does not want you to get healed or delivered. The enemy, I promise you, he does not want to see you healed or delivered. This is, this is your choice. And, and, and what was stopping our, our middle warrior up here was his pride. And he wanted to hide his sins and suppress his sins. He wanted to protect his image instead of, I give up. I give up, God. And that's where, that's where healing and restoration comes in at. Okay, so that's, do we want to do that? Do you guys understand this? Okay, but we don't need to talk about what's permissible in sex, do we? <laughs> we have to talk about that. What's permissible in sex?
So just as long as you're married, everything's permissible? Got it. Some sort of God-approved sex. Well, what? Okay, let me ask you something. Uh, anal sex, permissible? No, no. Are you sure? Yes. Are you sure? What about oral sex? Yes. A lot of them don't know. Yeah. He's been, he's been reading the Song of Solomon. What about, what about uh, cosplay? You know, me, Tarzan, you, Jane. No. It depends. It depends. What about vibrators? No. Yes. No. Yes. What about porn? No. No. What about multiple partners in your bedroom? No. Okay. You got scripture on this? No. So here, here's how you triangulate. Just remember this, We're, and we'll put this to the test here in just a second as we wrap this up. First of all, you have to ask yourself, you've got three questions. Number one, is what you're asking about prohibited by Scripture? Does Scripture say no? Okay. Number two, does what you're talking about involve anyone else? And number three, is it beneficial? So, this oral sex. Is it prohibited by Scripture? No. Is it? No, it's not. It's not. Some of you are not sure. Because there are some, some of you will interpret that passage in Song of Solomon that that's, that's not sex between a man and a woman. Good luck with that. That's, that that's, that's your call, man. That's up to you. But if you really study it out and you're honest, there are some translations where the guy is saying, He's describing his, his, his five senses are involved. His, his sight, hearing, smell, taste, everything. And he's describing what's under her tongue. He says, honey is under your tongue. And then he says, your thighs are like, 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 like palm, palm trees. And between your thighs, and he talks about things he tastes, sees, and hears. And she says, blow in my garden. And he starts talking about how her garden is just erupts and flows. Dude, that's Bible, man. And so, and here's the thing where oral sex is concerned. You, as a, as a husband in particular, you do not have a right to tell your wife, do this to me. Because that's how I interpret that. You don't have a right to do that. And don't you dare take your wife to the pastor and say, pastor, make her do this to me. Oh, you think I'm kidding. I've had people do this. She won't do oral sex on me. Because here's the bottom line. What goes on between you and your spouse is between you, your spouse, and God. You guys work that out. If she ain't into that or if he's not into it, don't do it. Period. Next question. This is why when we do pre-marriage counseling, this is one of the questions I make people talk about. What's permissible on sex? Young girl, young guy, what's permissible on sex? You talk about it right now. And not with me around. You guys need to figure this out. Because whose parameters usually always are wider? The guys, because the guy's like, what's permissible? <laughs> and, and she's like, and so you guys have to work this out. Because if you don't do it before you get married, it will happen and it will come up in your marriage. You have to talk about it. Right? Okay, so... Is it prohibited by scripture, oral sex? Mm, not necessarily. Does it involve anyone else? It shouldn't. And is it beneficial? It could be. All right. What about vibrators? No. Triangulate. It's not it's not it's not is it pro are vibrators prohibited by scripture? No. no. I haven't found it. Does it uh, vibrators, do they involve anyone else? Yes, how? Because. Like, <laughs> what are you doing? <laughs> yes, it does. Because, like, can you make it? Like, that's not you. What? No. No, 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 no. Don't, don't go too deep on this. Because, and I'll explain in just a second. Does it involve an, somebody else, like a third person in your bedroom? No, it does not. So, there's a no. Is it beneficial? It can be. 
I promise you, I have pastor friends. She had a hysterectomy, and so her plumbing is off, and so there's a lot going on down there, and they use vibrators. They use vibrators, and they're happy. They're fine. What's the problem with using a vibrator? Dependency. Somebody said it. Yeah. What do you mean? He said dependency. Like what is it? Yeah. You be careful about that. Because can a guy compete with a vibrator? No. No. There's so much to this. What about anal sex? Is it prohibited by scripture? Yep. Some of you don't know. It is. Does it involve anyone else? Not necessarily. And is it beneficial? Not even close. It's destructive is what it is. Of course, yeah, yeah, yeah. There's a lot of laws that forbid. <laughs> so. it's, uh, Sodom. It's a form of sodomy. And sodomy is not just oral sex, it's anal sex too. So, and you start, you know what a catonite is? A catonite? These are men boys, boy lovers, and things like that. Anal sex. It's, it's all that, and that fornication stuff in 1 Corinthians. Six. Okay, wait. Uh, what else? What else? What else? Cosplay. Anime. Uh, what was the name? Sakura and Naruto. Can you do that? Dragon Ball Z. Can we do this? No, Dragon Ball Z is not an anime. I don't know what. What are you gonna say? Yep, because that's, she's exactly right. Because I've seen guys in, in little sitcoms where the guy's lusting after a blonde all day long, and then his wife is a redhead, and he gets home and he bought a blonde wig, and he says, put that on, woman, let's go. What's he doing? That's exactly right. He's using his wife to fulfill a fantasy that he had. No, you can't do that. Dad, God is not a part of that. What else? I'm still struggling. I don't, I don't, <laughs> I don't agree on the vibrator. But I mean, That's fine. That's because true. that, if it's a threesome, it's, it's you, a the not. wife, if the husband, the wife, and God, then now you're introducing a third thing. Yeah, it's not a third person, but it's a third thing. Like, in reality, the... You be careful. Like, Go ahead. You're, you know, you are in complete nakedness. So, like, there is nothing other than you and the woman. And yes. now you're introducing something. So okay, I love you, man. So I know exactly what you're trying to say. I love you, but you're speaking like a child. Can I say something? Because there, I, I get your passion in this because because you're coming across as that this is what I'm where I'm at and what I believe. What about lubricant, KY jelly? That's that's, that's something. It's a substance. It's something else. What about condoms? I don't even know what that is. Yeah, and so I have friends who they have to use vibrators because her stuff is messed up. She doesn't, it doesn't do anything for her. And I have friends that um, they, they don't produce any fluids and there's a lot of dry stuff going on. And so they need lubricant because without lubricant, it's very, very, very painful. And no, that's lubricants. Yes. Yeah, oral sex, we're not talking about ingesting semen. There's a difference, oral sex and ingesting semen, two different things. All right, just for clarity. Okay? What are you going to say, Whitney? Oh, no, I was going to say whenever it comes to like vibrators, like, and I could be wrong, that whenever it becomes a problem is whenever the girl uses it by herself because that's a form of... Uh, like, You're right. You're, like, it's the same, it's that <coughs> is likened to a guy coming over here on UDP married and masturbating to his wife on FaceTime. That's a no-no. That's a no-no. Why? It is not the real thing. What about if we're just, you know, what are you doing to each other? What are you doing to each other? Yeah, 
And so basically, you're, you're, you're talking to each other thinking, oh, we're together. You're, no, 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 no. First of all, guys, you can wait six months. You can. And I promise you that post-deployment sex is going to be good. But also, you're creating the habit. Like you said, all sex connects you. And we've had this happen again and again and again and again and so many times. Guys will come over here and they'll develop a masturbation habit or a masturbation habit, even FaceTiming their wife. And... They'll call us later and say, yeah, I got home, post-deployment sex was good. But then what ends up happening, we're in trouble. What happened? Well, uh, about a month later, she said she had a headache and didn't want to do it on Monday. So I waited to Tuesday. And then she said she was tired. And then she waited to Wednesday and said she had a headache. And so basically, I went three days. with. And so basically, I quit asking because I don't like rejection. And I don't want to bother her. So I just went and masturbated. Because, and translate that. When a guy starts masturbating, what's he saying to his wife? I don't need you for this. I can take care of myself and go masturbate. Yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. So anyway, I hope that, does that make sense, Joe? Is that what you were saying? Yeah, that makes sense. What else? You got to be careful about becoming dependent on these images like cosplay. Because some, some guys, you know, they, they like Tarzan and Jane. And they depend on Tarzan and Jane. Or they're over here looking at pictures of their wife and masturbating. That's, that's an image of your wife. It's not your wife. And you're touching yourself. It's flesh. Anything else? Uh, I have a question about that. Yeah. So, so what, if it's, what if it's something like, like, like doctor? Or it's not like a something what? Like something like, doc, like doctor. Or it's not like a specific character or something. Or like I don't, what, what do you mean? I think it means like a scenario. Like a doctor. It's still me, but I'm not going to. Oh, yeah, yeah. Go for it, man. <laughs> have fun. It's recreation. Have fun. You can pretend. You can pre- you can pretend swing from the chandeliers and attack your wife. That's fine. <laughs> Seriously, you can come swinging into the room with your little loincloth and grab her. Go, oh, me Tarzan. Boom and take her. But just don't become dependent on that. You got to be careful about becoming dependent on that. It's about sure recreation, imagination, have fun. Just don't be careful. Be careful. What else? Go ahead. If you if you're convicted by something, don't do it. If you're convicted by something, don't do it. If if, if, if you, she you want to suck her toes, but she says no, don't do it. Wait till she goes to sleep or something. It's a joke. I'm joking. <laughs> no, I'm joking. You guys know what I'm talking. Don't do it. Just work it out. Talk to each other. Talk to each other. I know people are, they, 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 wrestle, they wrestle with this stuff. Um, and I would caution, I would caution you guys about videotaping or taking pictures of your, your wife or yourself in the nude. You don't want that kind of stuff out there. Uh, we used to do personal effects and supply for people that went to the brig or died or something like that. And there's nude pictures of their spouse and all kind of other stuff. So you be careful about, oh, this is just for me. Ain't nobody going to see these. Don't do it. Don't do it. Yeah, what do you need that for? You don't. Anything else? Okay, let's stand up. Okay. Look, we're going to do one more prayer, and then we're going to wrap this up. So what I want you to do, prayer up with somebody and pray. Pray.